Welcome to the Startup Grind. So hi guys, uh, welcome for the fourth Startup Grind event uh, here in Cluj-Napoca. Uh, hopefully you had a nice summer vacation. Uh, I will go straight into presenting our guest for today and for this uh, edition. Uh, Robert Mureshan uh, started one of the first game development companies studios here in Romania back in 2002. He is the CEO of ExoCFN Studios for the past 12 years. Recently he opened a US office where he is in the CTO position. His main role is to design and develop the core parts of the ExoCFN games. Games developed by ExoCFN Studios were ranked among world wide bestsellers with around 500,000 licenses activated in the last three years alone. Robert dropped out of computer science in his final year and never graduated, but I guess that turned out very good for him. So please uh, give him a round of applause. <laughs> so hi Robert and welcome. Thank you for my, my invitation. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, Usually we like we at the beginning of the interview we go straight uh, into finding out some things from your like childhood and like uh, telling us about yourself and as as you were a kid and uh, about your passions what did you study and how all this influenced you in getting you to this moment like in having a quite a successful company let's say well I ended up in IT actually by accident. I... I was highly passionate about physics. I was, I was a national Olympics physics, math, chemistry, stuff like that. I attended a few contests and after graduating junior high, the only obvious option to pursue a career in this was to go to a computer science high school or then choosing foreign languages or something like that. So I was okay. I never touched the computer until I went to high school. So I said, okay, I'm gonna, they do computers, whatever. The main thing I'm interested in is that they were doing heavy math, physics, chemistry, the kind of things I enjoyed. So of course, like everyone, I, the first thing I discovered on a computer that computers can run these great things called games, which help us waste our valuable time and do nothing. So of course, like so, like perhaps a lot of us, it was like a crazy dream, like okay, I want to make games. This looks cool. Yeah, it was a stupid enough high school dream, and I started pursuing that dream. Started learning programming. Started actually started doing a 3D engine back in '96. I started liking the whole thing, uh, further I went, went to Babish Boy University in computer science. I got in back in 1999, just, I took a difficult exam, math and stuff. And from there on I started spending a lot of time in, in and around game development. It was quite a small market market or business associate back, at, back, at, back in the days. There was only one company in Romania, Fun Labs. They were foreign Fun Labs, was about it. So, I ended, up, I ended up writing articles at that time for foreign magazines and at one point I got into some heavy, deep, heavy conversations with the guys at 3D FX Interactive. It's a defunct, com defunct company today, but some of us, for some of you might remember, some of you not, I'm going to tell you briefly who 3D FX Interactive were. They were the first guys who made a dedicated 3D graphics video card and that allowed us the beautiful 3D graphics we have today on mobile phones and uh, computers as such. They were like the founding fathers of modern computer 3D graphics. Spent most of my most of my three years of college doing research, math, 3D graphics. I still read on time from time to time, I have a lot of stuff that I probably should publish someday but I didn't go around it. So I so totally accidentally I got involved with a friend from Australia and he said, hey, well, let's make this game. I'm going to fund the development, let's split the profit, so on. Okay, so I started doing that, it turned out good. Started taking up more of my more and more of my time until I realized this was like a full-time thing and just at one point I totally forgot about college, forgot about anything and went on. And from there until today, the rest is history. I guess I grew up during this time, my childhood pretty Let's see if it, I was passionate about radio, electronics, astronomy. Spent about four or five years doing astronomy. Spent reading thousands of books and everything. And this is one thing I always emphasize. Get a good, solid education because you're not going to go anywhere without it. At one point at the municipal library, I didn't have a car. They were just letting me take whatever you want, bring them back and whatever. I used to like 
hundreds of books every month, and I read, read everything from biology to philosophy to all kind of stupid stuff or crazy stuff, but then later on it turned out to be extremely useful at one point. For example, we're doing VR now and we have a proper understanding of how the human brain works and how it balances your emotions and everything, you're going to get stuck pretty fast in the whole technology. I see. So, you said that you read a lot of books. What was uh, the main, I mean, the best book you liked so far? Best book, uh, it depends if you mean literature or science books. Uh, I don't know, let's say one science and one literature. Literature, uh, a series of novels from H.P. Lovecraft. Okay. I don't remember the exact, it was a Romanian translation, The Monster in the Doorstep, or thing, I think, or something like that. It was, it was like kind of a horror story, but quite interesting because it made you feel like everything was real that whole horror story but at the end actually the all novels ended in a big question sign was it all real or just in your imagination it looked real enough in your imagination but then again it also showed an aspect that maybe it's not really imagined the whole it's a, it's, it's a very good lecture so just play with your, with your mind and then <laughs> <laughs> uh, i guess reading uh, horror novels and books and science fiction and literature, I guess it helps you a lot in establishing like the core uh, of, of, a, of a game like in your exactly. industry. As you might have obviously guessed, yes, I'm a big science fiction fan. Always been. Probably gonna be. Um, so, you got straight into ExoCFN. Yes. So, tell us about, like, I mean, the ExoCFN story in terms of how did you got for example, uh, to the name exactly, because I, I've read it about you, but like I mean, I the name has no meaning. That's the whole. Like, actually, that's the whole point of the company. We are not. We are. We're not being inspired by anything or anyone. Just do new stuff, innovative stuff. Okay. It kind of reflects the core values of the company and our product. We're always gonna. Well, we have always time. We're always gonna do stuff that nobody else has done before. So we're not gonna. Make Flappy Bird go into Flappy Bird clothes, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to disappoint everyone, but that's not gonna happen. Uh, and like we had a, a, a discussion uh, previous the previous days, and uh, Robert told me that he has uh, no team, for for example, now, and that you are working with a remote team. How is this like? What are the the good things and the bad things having a remote team? Bad team, bad sides, uh, I can't think about one. I work with remote teams because we, work on, we always work on pretty high profile stuff and I always like people that are like brilliant and good in what they do so I'm always hunting down extremely smart people and I'm working with them and it's easy to work with people that are extremely skilled and talented because they usually have a way have an IQ way more over average and it's, they are reasonable, they are easy to work with and for example one of the guys I've been uh, working with on porting on one of our games on Mac OS and he went on after working well with us, he went on to Amazon and from there today to Bad Corporation. So yeah. I'm kind of like a high talent seeker. I always like to have small, compact and extremely efficient teams. I don't I like having offices like other people doing nothing every day because the kind of stuff we do requires people that know what they're doing and most importantly love what they're doing. So I always tell people that there are no deadlines, there are no budget constraints, there's no crap like that. Just I need I need a twice as better job than you promised. So I I don't, I don't care how long does it take, I don't care how much does it cost. We're not pressured by investors or yeah. how do you find them like I mean the top uh, skilled guys in game development, I guess it's not something regular or very ordinary to, to find everywhere. So, I mean, do you approach an HR company or something like... No, I usually I have good connections in, in the community and actually one or two times they find me. So, that's a good point. They come and say like, hey, I would be interested in working on that project. I'm a good environment artist or I'm a good programmer or... So do, you, like, do you get a lot of resumes straight to your uh, inbox? Like? Yes, I do, but uh, I just most of the time I offer a courteous reply and the kind of people I work with, they never have a <laughs> You just know who they are and they know who you are and things are just going to happen. I see, so it's uh, basically experience proven. I'm working with an extremely well-paid environment artist right now. I can't remember if you've seen some screenshots and uh, 
Uh, I saw some of his work, we uh, gave him a call, we met up and in about five minutes we were done and set to go. I haven't even asked him what if he graduated or whatever. I just saw some of his work, I loved his work and said, okay, that's it. Do you want to work on this project? Sure. Yeah. And it was like a five minute discussion and we were through with that. Cool. Um, have you ever thought like you are now a successful business businessman, entrepreneur like for the local ecosystem? Have you ever thought about became, becoming a business angel or an investor in the, in the local system, in the local tech ecosystem? Not really, because I'm not doing this for the business side of things. I do this because I love it. So, yeah, I would probably do it if, it's, if the project is interesting enough for me. I'm not going to do it for the money because I don't make a lot of it, so that's not a problem. Yeah. So, I'm, yeah, I would probably do it at one point if it's an interesting enough project, something that brings something new to the table. Yes, I could. I would probably do that. So you would be like, for example, you would be open for if somebody will come to you. Look, I need advice, and maybe if you like, maybe if you like the project, maybe you can fund it or something. Because from all the discussions which, like, we the tech community and startup community have, it's uh, mainly the problem that we don't have venture capital and we don't have don't have seed come seed. Why did you never use venture capital? I would have walked away from it even today. Yeah, but like, I mean, I mean, it's not about luckiness, but. Uh, not all, all of us have the grit or you know, to go after it. And, uh, that's, I mean, that's what you get when you, when you do things because you love them and you don't have passion. Yeah, probably, probably so. But yeah, there are, there are things that they probably would require investment of. I know because we run some pretty high budget projects and probably one that could be a thousand budgets. Yeah. Some of those budgets are so high. Yes, but a lot of people are not into this, for, so you, you, you gotta filter it out well because you'll probably see a hundred ideas. Yes, I get hundreds of emails with a hundred crazy proposals, like I get this totally long email, somebody, I want to give you an example, someone asking me to fund a game that's like, the guy goes to like a half a page of scrolling, like this is totally brand new, never before seen, unbelievable, crazy, unique game development idea. Then he started a new bread. it's a game about car, uh, car and racing cars. So yeah, that's, that's, that's <laughs> how you know what you do. Probably nobody has ever played one of those games. So, like, so, I, so, so the, then you are like uh, the reverse side in terms of, um, I've overheard once uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, the social media expert, getting a question like, uh, what do I have to do to fund me? You know, So he said, you don't have to do anything, like do your job perfectly and get in that position so I can reach, like I can hear about you and I will come to you and as a bunch of other projects, so I guess you're more of a, that type of a guy. So. Actually, I'm doing, I'm doing something similar to that. It's, for example, when I see talented people which are like stuck in jobs below their, below their, uh, their, below their work skills. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hire them or contact them and pay them more than they would expect. Yeah. And recently, somebody came to me and asked me if I would be willing to pay more for a project and actually I paid him, I offered him more than he asked for, so it was like kind of stuck. So I said, yeah, you wear with your money, so use it. Yeah, that's, that's kind of pretty much the same thing. So, yeah, if it's talent, if it's talent, I'm, I'm going to probably, I'm probably going to probably do it. It's been on, uh, it's all my idea, but I really never didn't go around it. Maybe I'm going to go around, get around for a year or two and things cool down, we involved in all the projects now too. Maybe start start up an investment fund and do it that way professionally. Yeah. Not so many interesting projects around here. Or maybe or the interesting ones are usually die fast and people don't have the energy or willingness to pursue them. I've seen some cool ideas, but just people drop them suddenly. Lose the passion and drive. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. uh, I know that you started with Hacker uh, Hacker Evolution, yes. Evolution and uh, Rail uh, Adventure. So that's being developed right now. Yes. Yeah. Um, have you ha like? Do you have any plans for another one in the near future? Uh, not really. We're gonna focus on Hacker Evolution series because it's quite a cult classic. It's all over a million copies on Steam only, and people are actually demanding, not expecting that for us to make a new version. So we're working on. It's a car classic thing about Tomb Raider. They do it after 20 years, then people are buying it and buying it Tomb Raider that comes out. <laughs> We're probably going to do that. Uh, Rail Adventure is a new idea which actually started out as me exploring some new type of gameplay, new kind of gaming. It's pretty difficult because in your career, you're not going to, not going to make 100 games. If somebody tells that you made us 100 games, they're probably crap. Yeah. It's making a good game, coming up with some new innovative gameplay, it, it usually takes years. 
real venture he's been developed like three or four years. It never been this hasn't been a main project until recently when things changed with the whole VR thing. But yeah, I spent about 12 years trying to design some new immersive gameplay and VR came along quite nicely. Yeah, I'm playing with some. I always have 12 ideas I'm thinking about it. For the moment this should be. It. I'm gonna see what VR will have to open we have to offer us because I expect it to be a big revolution and it's gonna offer us completely new ways of seeing and playing and experiencing games. This was my next question, like what do you think about VR in gaming? It's like, the next thing. It's, yeah. it's gonna be imagine like going from the old computers to comic displays or something. Like that. So it's pretty much an even bigger step. I'm not sure if any of you tried playing VR it's amazing and uh, it was amazing back in the Oculus which is like pretty crappy compared to the hardware we have. We are pretty privileged to have one of the very few HTC Vive prototypes in the world at our offices and play around with them. It's, cool. it's amazing. It, cool. And it's also it's going to change the feel, the way you see not only games, it's going to go into apps too. Because until now you were like stuck on a small display, right? So that was your whole area of seeing things. Well, imagine being able to see everything around you. Imagine, actually, let's go a bit outside games. Imagine like working on a project like documents. Imagine having an Excel table there and having a Word document there and having the browser open there and just turn your head and it's gonna quite give you the Iron Man kind of thing. Like, you know, <laughs> yes, you're gonna be able to touch things with your hand and move them yeah. around. It's gonna offer you a much, much, much wider field of view in terms of processing data and visualizing information and that kind of, that kind of stuff. It's gonna be like an even bigger step than then going from the old monochromatic displays, if some of you, you remember those, to like the big kick-ass, nice flat screens. So this is gonna be like exponentially bigger in terms of what, what you're gonna... Of course, first we're gonna do games, porn and the usuals, and then you're gonna start using this for serious things like data visualization. Yeah. One project I have with this, which is totally outside games, is having a whole city built up in a wireframe and aggregate all kind of data from social media, public webcams. So you're actually being able to virtually explore a city in real time. You're not going to be able to do that on a display, but you're going to be able to do that perfectly fine. That's job. awesome. And yeah, it's going to have a lot of ramifications. It's a research project because it can go even to fields like law enforcement or defense technologies or so on. Yeah. Imagine having a stolen car and being able to follow it in real time in VR. So you don't have like to actually do an actual pursuit for like police officers and just yeah. do it in real time or find missing persons. It's extremely advanced and it takes a lot of processing power and some new math models that we need to develop to use all that data and process it. So it's probably 10 years before you're gonna you have some time to wait. <laughs> yeah, a lot of work. Yeah, uh, I had this uh, idea a couple of uh, weeks back that if it's like could it be possible, you know, to go into a game like VR perspective and uh, go into a store in, in New York and maybe buy something from there and then ship it over to, to my house, you know, so... Yeah, it's very easily do I guess that would be... Actually, Valve has a demo on that. It's actually a shop demo, so it's actually walk around the shop and you can see stuff on the shelves. So it's not quite a big deal. But yeah. Probably someone's going to do it. Because as I was mentioning before, VR is going to offer you a whole new way of seeing things because you shop online, right? So you have a couple of screenshots and that's about it. how you will be able to see the whole thing from any angle you want. For example, you want to buy a camera that's filming us, right? So you go to, you go to an online store and you see a couple of photos of that and test specs. What if you would be able to look at it from any angle and study it and see its size and whatever might interest you? You are in the indie games development. Uh, I mean, which games people like? Do they like more? Like from your experience, something now? Do, do they like go into the indie games, or do they go like into the classic uh, video publishing games from from the video publishing games company? Like to which they do are, are they going? Into? They like good games. They like good games. That doesn't matter who makes them. Okay. Because actually, the whole the whole indie concept it's it's like a uh, pretty blurred out thing now. Because yeah, technically we're indie. Practically, if you look at our revenues and our sales and our budgets and everything, we're quite a big company. So I don't know where that puts us. Yeah, maybe we may, yes, we might be independent because there is no investor or somebody pushing us to do this and do that and cut corners and meet deadlines or whatever. People, people are usually going to play good games. I, 
I play games, I, I really look at who actually made the game, unless I really love it. So I get to look at who made the game after I actually played the game, or I was yeah. interested in the game. So basically, people like good games. And the whole indie scene is now kind of like pretty much going down here because there are a lot of crappy games showing up and poor quality and actually putting our name you know, pretty bad. Like, I think you're all familiar with whatever happened on the Google App Store and iOS app store, like I think we have like what 2 billion Flappy Bird clones and mm. 4.5 billion Candy Cross Saga clones and all that stuff. Actually, I haven't used an app store in years. You can't find it in years. Yeah. Full of crap. Um, like, now that you have in your portfolio uh, Hacker Evolution Great Adventures, you said that, I mean, you have a new adventure daily in the game. Yeah, really. What is it about? We're publishing indie games, we're selling them, so I basically buy a pack of six games discounted for like 99 cents or $1.49. Okay. And it's uh, a very interesting, a very, a very good way of selling. So basically a kind of an app store, exactly. app store yeah, so it's more curated and game focused. Well, uh, we choose the games we, we bundle and currently we're selling something like a media license the month, somewhere around that. Go fast, actually, it started last year. It was, uh, it was an idea I've been playing well, my girlfriend had more spare time than me, so I said, okay, you want to take care of that, manage that business, I'm going to do that side and let's get it started and see where it goes. Yeah. And actually, in about a year or so, in terms of revenue and profits, it does bigger than the whole exam has to do, so I'm pretty much <laughs> trying, to, <laughs> trying to keep up with, with the running the company. So you have a competition at home. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. <laughs> It's yes. pretty big and it's uh, still a lot of work because I want to well, do quite some innovative. I want to do game trading and I want to do something pretty stupid and crazy. I want to change the whole way people sell games and buy games. I want to I turn the games market into something like the stock market um, based on supply demand offer and bid ask prices. So uh, having a way of obtaining a math math is perfect. I like math. It's the, the best possible sales for the developer, for the best possible price for the gamers. Because when, when you sell something, you like put ten dollars on it. But what's your logic behind putting ten dollars? Because the other guy put ten dollars on it. That's stupid logic. So uh, this is something I've been studying outside game development. It goes more into marketing, business, and math. It is uh, what is the optimal price for a product. Let's say you're selling chairs, like those red chairs, and you have those chairs for like. Let's say $25. And you manufacture the chairs for $20, so you have a $5 margin. And maybe at $25, you sell three chairs a week. That's going to make a $50 profit. But maybe if you drop the price at $24, you are going to sell six chairs that make a make a profit. How do you figure all this out? You don't. Okay, you're probably going to do trial and error and discounts and try and average them out, but that's not how it's going to play out. So, what if you have 100 chairs and 100 people interested in buying chairs and you set a minimum price for which would be we need to sell, of course, that's your, the price at which you manufacture chairs plus a profit margin and let the 100 people bid for that chair and see what comes up. So you want to sell chairs and have people bid their price and maybe you're going to be able to sell more in terms of amount of units of profit if you let people choose their price. So everyone's going to be happy. Yeah. People are going to get a better price, you're going to have a higher sales one and it's basically a one big scale economic optimization. So it's a win-win situation, yeah. That's for everyone. A win-win situation even for the local economy. Particularly for me because I want to control the whole thing. <laughs> um, how did you, like, how did you get to daily in the game? Like, what was the, the spark, the, the idea behind it? Did you identify something like that, for example, I don't know, was it from because of the, all the crap on the app store? Or no, we wanted, to, we wanted to get into publishing at one time. And I'm willing to go into the straightforward publishing of I'm um, getting capital of 10, 20, 30 games and try and do publishing on all the other channels. So I said, okay, let's take games that are already out there and just try and do a better marketing. And yes, we did a better marketing. We, we have games for which we made sales like five, ten times bigger than Steam before them. So we focus, we focus a lot on developing markets, Asia, Russia. Latin America, stuff like that, and yeah. there's, a, there's a huge market. And we did some really crazy and uh, out of the box thinking to come some marketing ideas. One thing we do is you buy a bundle of games for a set price of 149 If you pay more than the average price, 
get two copies, you get two copies of each game. But if you pay more than the average price, you're gonna drive up the average price, and then you're gonna have to pay more. This, this, so this, this thing that it's, it kind of always balances out at about 157. It's very interesting from that perspective. And how about this help help us sell more? So we might ask, okay, what's the big idea beyond, behind the, instead of selling a red chair for ten dollars, selling two red chairs for eleven dollars? You know what's the big idea? I'm going to take the red chair and I'm going to take the other red chair and trade it for something I don't have. Because there is a whole huge market of trading games, which is unregulated, nobody controls. It's a giant forum. So for example, there's a forum that has like 640,000 people on trading games with each other, trading licenses. So I said, okay, how do I get access to them? I know, I'm going to be the only company. If when you buy something from us, you can keep half, one copy and play it, and the other half can go and trade it. And this makes it extremely attractive for them to buy from us. <laughs> because technically, it's like you buy two red chairs and you change one for a camera. So you got a camera and a red chair for the same price almost. Just a bit more. And it turned out to be quite a, quite a well thought marketing thing and played out nicely because the usual way of promoting and selling stuff like advertising banners and classic advertising on Facebook is dead. Just want to waste your money. So these days, if you want to drive sales, you gotta, you gotta find fair and optimal ways of getting your product to the customers. So the standard way of I'm selling something for ten dollars and advertising on Facebook, that's that. That's just a waste of time. Probably gonna get some results, but nothing worth mentioning. It's called an offering. Um, so you have you have Daily Indie Game, you have Hacker Evolution, uh, Rail Adventure. Basically, these are all all your products. Yes. So. Can you can you can you tell that are you a one hundred percent product company or do you accept uh, I know like outsourcing like what it's the percent the bigger percentage of companies tech companies from IT it's outsourcing so they are all trying to shift now into product but you're a big player a strong player like in in front for product development so oh I I, I did the quote for which I'm pretty popular outsourcing is like intellectual prostitution so you're not gonna get <laughs> selling your brain for whoever bids higher. No, we don't do outsourcing uh, on, on an extremely rare occasions and under two circumstances. One, I have to like the project and two, I'm going to build the hell out of you. Mm -hmm. So we had a multinational coming to us to make a, some game for them. So I said, okay, if I like that, yeah, I'm going to do it. But I told them, I'm not going to give you a cost-effective solution by far because we're not outsourcing. If you want a good game, well executed, come to us. If you want it, want it, just want it done for a good price, go somewhere else because you're not going to like the price. Okay, they, they eventually accepted, they had no criteria to build something like $20 for my working hours. So, and yeah, we delivered, they were happy, but uh, we're not outsourcing in terms of competing prices, and it's just not worth my time because I'm the same, I can make the same amount of money in the same amount of time doing my products, but after the product is closed, I can keep on selling. Yeah. Because we make the kind of stuff that sells. The first hand cradle from the series was released in 2007, like eight years ago, and still selling it. So. I like to stop that pays in the same month, every month the same amount, not just one time. Right? Yeah, yeah, of course. There's a lot of competition in outsourcing and just driving prices down and because the quality is crap and and that's not really IT, that's kind of like borderline of IT. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for example, if somebody would go now into into game development game the game development business, what would be your advice to them? PC games. PC games. Exactly. Yes. I know I know mobile is the big thing, but it's not. Well, it depends. I think it depends on the industry. Maybe in e-commerce e e and uh, I don't know, social networks. But mostly e-commerce, maybe mobile is the big, next big thing. But I, I, don't, I don't know. Mobile is a good brand thing, but games. Yeah, you can, you can play nice games, but real gaming is still on PCs and consoles. Eh? I know it because well, I, I haven't had some successful games on it. 1.1 hour games. I was actually stripped down version of Little Adventure in 2009. At one point, I did some math. It was the number 205 most downloaded thing on the entire App Store. It was something like one out of, one out of 100 iPhones on the planet had the game installed. It was huge. It was driving like half a million downloads a weekend. This was back in 2009. And when the number of iPhones available it was like 50, 60 times more than today. Yeah. But yeah, I did. Yes, it was good. It had good results, but I had even better results in PC. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a good advice. I mean, it's a it's a, it's a much bigger market. Yeah, 
You have you have more computers able to run games than mobile phones on the planet, and people have more time. I I actually started playing games seriously weekend recently, and I tried some mobile games, but the, the real experience is like getting a gaming rig and playing still, how it's meant to be played. I still remember my days of playing Need for Speed, so yeah. It's, <laughs> <laughs> um, what be what would be like the best and your worst decision, decision until now? Best business decision. What start this company and uh, mm. drop out of college? Worst business decision. Mm. I think this affects numbers. <laughs> I, I think I have. I don't think I have one. Mm. No, actually, never know. I don't think I have one. Or, or something that worth worth mentioning having a big impact. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I missed the opportunity of buying download that row a couple of years ago, but like 50 euros and nobody took it. But yeah, download that row? Yeah, exactly. It was available. <laughs> and I, and I, was, I was a cheap best, so I'm going to spend 50 euros on it for me. Okay, so it was back in 1999 or 2000. And it was kind of cool, quite somehow. Yeah, I was stupid enough not to buy it. So. And did you find out who took it or something? What is it now? I, I mean, I don't, I don't, know, about I don't know, but it's one of those uh, vintage domain names where we both. I collect domains. I have I have a lot of domains, and I, I, I like to own them because you know that they, they are better than real estate. It, it's not like a city that can expand. So, for example, on dot com, any good word you have, it's gone. It's yeah. only yours. Then. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like you, you really need to um, struggle to find a name which is uh, free on dot com. I mean, I struggled to find a name for a company for a client of mine for I think for two months to really find a brand name. So like we can have .com free and there's no trademark uh, involved on it. So, uh, Good luck. So <laughs> two two months for it. So yeah. Uh, about the local ecosystem, tech ecosystem. Like what what would you add to it? How can you help to make it better? Like for or like what can you add to it in terms of to go better and to grow stronger and faster? It's actually in Romania, it's very interesting. I actually am not, 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 not being part of the ecosystem because I travel a lot and I'm uh, not around most of the time and most of the time I'm stuck in my office so, or out somewhere. Uh, it's, it's highly divided. I mean, I think Romania, the only country that compared to the number of game developers it had, it never had a decent conference. I've been to one in Croatia, which is a lot smaller, a lot smaller than me. They had a much more vibrant environment. I mean, I don't know, people just want to talk to each other. I don't know why. <laughs> Act like girls or something like that. I don't know, it could be maybe my perception. I'm way too busy or traveling most of the time, so I rarely get on to meet people from the local ecosystem. I think being right here, it's first time maybe probably like two years or something like that. Yeah. Actually, yeah, this, 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 you caught me in a lucky moment. I actually decided to stay at home for like two months. I, I got tired of traveling at home. I got seriously tired. <laughs> Spending one of three nights in hotels and one of ten nights living on airplanes gets to your home. Yeah, jet lag. Um, just as a as a add on to the previous question, like for for the product development, like to to the shift is slowly. What do you think we need as a local tech ecosystem to bridge this gap? And do you think that we need more seed seed money or like, uh, for the? I mean, in terms of mindset. The mindset of the companies, what they would need to do with that. Think big and think on, uh, think, in, think in perspective of long term. Everybody, everybody's trying to do something that's going to make money or success on uh, as fast as possible. You know, the lower hanging fruit theory where people try to first pick the lower hanging fruits on the tree. So I'm, I'm not doing that. It's, uh, I, maybe people should start thinking about making bigger projects or things that have a bigger impact. Not, not small games, if you want to specifically talk about games, don't just think about whatever makes you quick buck like the next month or next six months. As you mentioned, Red Adventure, that thing's under development for like three or four years. The original Hacker Revolution was under design for two years before going to development, but that game was the number four best selling game in the world when we released it. And yeah, that's sort of like crazy. We, we actually, we were, we outsold quite some big and well known AAA titles. Did they so, get pissed? <laughs> yeah, actually, I, mean, I have an interesting story. I'm not going to give names. Of emails. Like ironically, 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 <laughs> ironically, something like uh, 10 days before going live on Steam, a uh, headhunting company came to me and wanted to recruit me for one of the guys to run some new offices they were planning to open. And uh, 
obviously I went to this interview and I had a fishing contest with a guy from there, got one of the things and one week later when I, when I got back to Romania and we outsold the latest titles, you know, <laughs> um, unfortunately yeah, I didn't have to find their offers, so yes, yeah, it's doable if you, if you think big. You don't, that's that's why I don't like outsourcing. It's, it's not going anywhere. Yeah. You, you're not gonna make. You're not gonna make. So you, okay, you can scale up the company, rent another floor, hire more programmers. But uh, what you have there is linear growth. You're gonna never have exponential growth. And if you want to make something really big, you're gonna have, you're gonna have to figure out a way of having exponential growth. And you're not gonna have exponential growth by just linearly scaling up a company on vertical flows and hiring more guys and getting more outsourcing funds. That's. Awesome. that's why I tell you because what's the difference between a linear and exponential growth? It's in a linear growth, uh, the ratio between your, your input and uh, revenue, it's a constant. So you got, let's say you have 10 programmers to make 10,000 euros. You're going to have 20 programmers, you're going to make 20,000 euros. So you're never going to get onto an exponential growth. And if you look at any big company or big product, uh, you, have to, you have to get to a point from where, from where your revenue grows faster than your input and you're not going to get that just by doing it, by outsourcing yeah. projects. To be honest, and I know probably a lot of people are going to hate me for this now, do, I don't consider outsourcing to be the power of IT because it doesn't bring anything on the table. You just do someone that's dirty on there, that's about it. It's not about it. You, you're, not, you're not going to outsource the project where you really need an innovation. If you want innovation, you're going to do it yourself. I'm not going to hire a company and hey, come up with a good idea. If they are able to come up with a good idea, they're not going to sell it. They're not going to sell it to me, you know? Yeah, they're gonna do it on their own. So exactly. also seeing just like interesting, just doing relative stuff and it's about yeah. it. And yes, one thing I always emphasize through the years is that people should stop doing outsourcing and stop doing their own stuff if we want to develop. Otherwise, okay, that's a, not a bad thing to do outsourcing, but don't expect don't expect any amazing results there. Yeah. Because it's just a business like a grocery store. You sell the same amount of fruits every day, make the same revenue, and that's about it. You go home and Call a day. So we will continue to be mediocre in this uh, in this term. There's a there's a lot of talent being wasted in outsourcing company. I met I met a lot of people like working for ridiculously small salaries and they were like a street talent. The problem is that a lot of people uh, already in the tech industry is leaving the country because of better salaries and Yes, they do and now companies. now we got to a new step and not only when not only people are leaving, when companies are leaving. I've got in touch with a, with a company, with a consultancy firm from New York. Uh, we want to open a whole holding company there, and to my amazement, they call me back like 10 minutes from a Romanian phone number. They told me they have offices in Bucharest, like 10 employees. So, okay, so you got basically a consultancy, consultancy company that handles setting up companies in the United States. And judging by the fact that they have an office with 10 employees in Romania, that means they, they do have, gotta have a serious volume of business. Of incorporating companies abroad and managing them yeah. if, they, if they have a local presence. And a lot of people are, are moving abroad. We are slowly starting to shift our whole company to the United States and maybe just keep a local presence from time being while we're here for whatever we have to do locally and yeah. trade locally and stuff like that. Because there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy and a lot of stuff I don't want to get into. So at one point, you decide you're going to want to. What you want to focus on, the bureaucracy or getting your work done. Exactly. So we don't have a stock market, for example. Yeah, they started doing something now on, on the AO stock market, AO stock market, but it's still baby steps and it's not quite so well legal, legally regulated and supervised. And right. I, I wanted, I wanted to take my company public, and I'm probably going to do it at one point, but definitely not in Romania because yeah. it's the level of corruption and shady things that go on around the stock market, it's not something you want to do if you're serious about things. Yeah. Um, we mentioned USA, Europe and, uh, and gaming before. What do you do, what, what do you think in, in terms of gaming industry, US versus uh, EU? Well, it's actually blown up because we have companies headquartered, for example, Ubisoft. They had for their technical French company, but they have big offices in Canada, in Toronto, or Montreal. It's actually a pretty global industry because yeah, you might say, hey, I know this great French company that makes games. So you're going to go to their offices and you're going to see that the guys from Romania, the other ones from America, and the other ones from Syria, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, technically it's a French company, practically the people are from all over the world. So it's pretty blurred out now. It's, mm -hmm. it's no longer a, you know, virtually any, any big company, even as few, 
Except me, I work for people from like various kind of various kinds of like, I don't know. I even work for people that have to two months at one point they say both I don't even know. Yeah. So I was curious about the times and distance. It's a pretty global industry. It's because we have all this mobility today, we are able to work remotely, travel easily. So you're not gonna find companies. So you might go into an American company or a French company or a I don't know, Canadian company and you're gonna have find employees from all over the world. You don't have a majority, no, you don't even have a local majority anymore. Yeah. Robert, we got to uh, our last two questions. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you what's going to be the next big thing in the five, ten, fifteen years, like bold technologies. We talked about VR, but from your perspective and your experience, what do you think is gonna look like? Well, we we, we, need to, we need to find a way to make faster processors. We kind of stuck with processors, and uh, actually, actually, we, we kind of hit a hit a bottleneck in our computer area, and that's going to take a, what might be the next step is figuring out how to use more multiprocessing. Everyone has like four or five core processors, but actually, they're not being used for anything. Mm -hmm. Nothing is taking advantage of them. And, we kind of, uh, we've kind of, I don't know, maybe quantum computing or something. I mean, we need a revolution yeah. because we, we've kind of, we've kind of hit the edge of it. So if you look at one generation of processors to another, it's not quite such a big improvement. Nothing uh, used to happen a couple of years. We were more involved in our own lives, doubling the number of transistors. Or, because we actually have, we have reached the physical limitation. The size of a transistor is already at the wavelength. Of light, and you can't do it smaller than that because it's physically not going to work at the transistor anymore. Yeah. So, we need to find, figure out a new way of building computers. But maybe the next big thing will come, will, will come from hardware, and let's see what happens. Quantum computing looks, looks promising enough so far, and Google is investing a lot of money. And yeah, yeah, exactly. Or it might, come, it might come from software because we are able to uh, build computers with several processors, like. My new computer has like four cores in it, but we need to do all of this such a parallel computing. Actually, having having software that uses all those four cores. If you have four cores or eight cores or sixteen cores, but it's not really have to do anything. You still have ninety nine percent of whatever you're doing running on the one core and maybe some background processes. Yeah, yeah. But to get here, we actually have to rethink the whole way we write code and design applications and that. So very nasty area to be in. So we're standing on the edge of like quite the great transformation. It will happen, yeah. it will happen on the top of the idea. Yeah. Uh, my final question before going into Q&A. Uh, knowing what you know now, if you would start again, what would you do differently? Nothing, I would do the same thing over and over again. So plenty of simple trips. Exactly, cool. Uh, we'll go into, into the Q&A, so we have uh, we saw you had these ideas in many verticals of the tech industry. Would you add any to your portfolio? We saw you had in many verticals. I mean, this is mobile, I guess, uh, gaming, publishing. Would you go on into other industries? Yes, I would. Depending, depending uh, if I, if I would like the idea, I'm, I'm not going to do anything just because it's profitable enough or well paid. I actually, actually, the best thing I have in my whole career is I get to do stuff while I'm in the lab. My company makes enough money, so I like to worry about the kind of stuff. So, just if I wake up one morning and I want to do something, I'm going to do it. So, yes, I would go into anything that's interesting and most important brings an important change to the industry. I'm not going to do something just because I can do it better than you and or maybe 10% better. I'm going to yeah. do something different than what you or anyone else has done and something that brings some new value to the Industry or whatever, yeah, that, that might be. I think we need more guys like you. <laughs> Ever thought about philanthropic open source contributions? Which one is that? First one. Ever thought about philanthropic? Uh, uh, if, if you mean in terms of me, me supporting various projects, yes, we do that, but uh, as many other aspects of our company, uh, it's never public. We do, we even do it. The world came up, we do regular philanthropy and I support projects and people that, uh, that are doing great stuff, just I never make a big deal out of it or any public discussions or stuff like this. Don't you think it could benefit like from the point of view of branding for a company or something like that? Yes it does, but uh, we're pretty well known for what who we are and I, I just consider those kind of things like to be more private or 
don't know, if, if you want to do something, you want to have someone just go ahead and do it and don't brag about it. Uh, that's what it yeah. always boils down to this. Is there any recipe for big hits in gaming or is it just random as in Flappy Birds? It's not random. If you think Flappy Birds is random, I get story or not. I don't tell you a small story. Back before I went to college, I had one of those 3 to 10 Nokia cell phones in some of the members though. And it has, a, it has a great game of fun too. It's a kind of like an old game of moving beans from one can to another. Quite a basic idea. Think about that piece. The fact that the game looks simple doesn't mean it's a random accident. It does have a mechanic behind it that keeps you ridiculously engaged. I, I, I have done something, let's see if you want to take the flappy board example. I have done something uh, a couple of years ago, I discovered I, I, had, I had a Windows mobile pocket PC and I was going on vacation. I said, okay, yeah, let me get a game for this. Do something on the beach while I'm on the beach. And uh, yeah, I'm not sure if some people are familiar with the unblock me, unlock me puzzle game where you have to slide pieces of various sizes and get one out. That, that, that thing really got to me. It took me about five or six days, days, days to finish the original ancient Chinese version. So then I got a Blackberry and I didn't have this game anymore. So I said, okay, I'm gonna remake this. It was a simple enough game, so I'm gonna do it for myself. So I, I, uh, so I, so I, once, I took like a Sunday or so to make the game for Blackberry. I didn't, I didn't even read any code for the Blackberry before that, so I had to learn more platform and Java in Java. <laughs> So I went to run, run, run some tests on it, I went to the Blackberry forums and well, I was like a regular and he said, hey guys, I'm making this puzzle game, wanna test it? So it was something like, oh come on, another shitty puzzle game, puzzle game, you don't wanna waste time with it. So I went back two days later and people were people were cursing me at, okay, but I've been trying to finish this game for two years, for two days and still is, that that's impossible. I think there's a bug, it can be finished. So so like three days go by and somebody finishes the game and says, oh my god, so this is not a bug. So they finish it in something like or 3,000 moves. The game can be finished in 89 moves. So then it went on to being like this endless street of discussion. Then I took the game commercially sold well. The Flappy Bird has that something that keeps you addicted. Maybe you have seen it in Tetris. Tetris is, a, Tetris, if, if I'm not mistaken, even one of today is it's one of the most played games in the world. And it looks simple enough, but it's not. It's, it has that something that keeps your brain engaged. Like building bricks and building bricks and building bricks. Haven't you seen the two, uh, two, the two things have Flappy Bird have in common with uh, Tetris is it's a never ending game. It always like keeps you on the edge, like you want to do more, you want to do more, you want to do more, and you want to do more, and you want to do more. So it's, uh, it, it's a, whoever did Flappy, yeah, it, it might be an accident him coming up with an idea, but he did come up with a good idea. So the only accident in the whole Flappy Bird story is that someone, that some random person had the good idea, but it had a good idea. <laughs> Because otherwise people wouldn't be, wouldn't, wouldn't be so engaged in that. And you would be just amazed to see what are the basic things that keep people engaged in games and it's not graphics and it's, Oh yeah, that, that make the game look good. People are usually always, uh, always like to... What you always like to do is uh, outdoor ourselves or complete it. So if you, I can tell you, if you build and build and you drop some build again, you're always gonna fall, wanna, wanna go further. So people... Uh, People when they come to games, they like things that don't end and at which you cannot anticipate the high score. So and this uh, this actually opens up the session and the and the and the curiosity in people. So if, if you're gonna look at successful games, what I have in common, most of them have this one thing: they're never ending games. So you always, there's always there's always this last question in your in your head when you put down your phone later at night and you reach the new high score. What if I can do better? <laughs> Try Triple Town, for example. I spent some 20, 25 euros on power ups in one day. It got to be bad and played by accident, and it's, it's, a, it's an amazing game. So, if you want to try something on the scale of Candy Crush or, or Flappy Bird, try Triple Town. It's amazing. Where do you get your inspiration from? from? I don't know, from stuff I do. I, I don't really I don't really look for inspiration. So I just. I'm pretty old school. I still have a, I still have a, a regular notebook and pen. So whenever something pops into my head, I just right. write it down. When it comes to games, I usually, I usually, I'm usually inspired by things I actually done or would have loved doing. So you might ask me where did I got the idea of Rail Adventures. I'm gonna tell you where, the, where I got this idea from. I have a restaurant for my child. Maybe I should have mentioned this. Or something like in high school, to a couple of friends of mine, and we used to like. Go to forest and whatever was around the city, around town. I always like exploring things, yeah. constructions, whatever. And we find we found this abandoned 
surface mining, they were mining uh, different rocks or whatever they were mining there. So they had this whole setup of tracks and carts. And cool, so that's from Yeah, so, from we, so we basically took a cart and put it up there and brought it up all the way up to the hill and then raced it down. So that was like the that's coolest awesome. thing to know. <laughs> really yeah, yeah, it was kind of like, you know, it's quite fun back in, back in those days. So, it, well, this whole surface mine totally abandoned and said, okay, let's see if we can do something cool here. So, like, Put the car back on the track, and <laughs> it wasn't quite a high slope. Uh, you don't need because it's heavy like hell, so it caught, caught quite a nice speed, and it was easy to push it back because the angle was quite like, two or three degrees elevation. And yeah. We like kept doing this thing over and over again. It was like fun enough. So that's cool. yeah. When we got the idea for Hacker Evolution, I and like everyone else, I got into hacking. I got into hacking quite bad at one point. Actually, I didn't want to get into hacking, but at one point they banned us from playing computer games in school. So. That wasn't cool. They put, on some, <laughs> they put on some security systems and it was something from Microsoft. It was some, some pretty complicated stuff, pretty stuff, pretty security stuff. Yeah. So basically, the whole thing was to like start two or three programs on a computer and that was about it. So I figured out a way to hack it and be able to play games <laughs> from there on. Uh, what are the benefits of gaming? You don't have to grow up. <laughs> uh, do you have any job openings? Uh, I don't have job openings, so I always look for people or people, but it just comes. I, I, yeah, I, I'm not already mentioned that. So I, actually, I, I, I hire people because they had some like, hey, let's do this thing because it's cool. I had a program like this. He, he came to me and said, Shouldn't you port your game to Mac OS? And he said, yeah, I don't have the time and we're going to do it. Would you like me to do it? Okay, be my guest. So, so we did it, I paid him and everything went down. So yeah. I don't keep regular job openings. I work with small, compact teams, but it's pretty fun to work with us. Yeah. So far people enjoy it. How do you see the future of the gaming industry? So we talked about it. Short oh, time yes. VR and everything. I think VR is gonna be the next thing. So just for the record to answer this question, I think VR is gonna be the next thing because it's gonna open offer gonna offer us a great Experience. For example, I have fear of heights. The first time when I played on a roller coaster in VR, that fear of heights was real. So we never, in, in games, you never really got to that point when you, when you actually can feel things for real. So it's gonna, this is gonna take things one step forward, one step forward. Another level. Uh, do do you have somebody in the game development industry as a model? Of course, I do. John Carmack of ID Software actually inspired my career and. I learned a lot of programming from his from his game source code, which he which he made public, and I used to read, read his his plant file. Well, before blogs were popular, there was this thing called plant file, similar to blogs. You under Unix, you used yeah. to like write whatever you were doing, and people could read your plant file. So yeah, he's been like he's been like 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 my role model. I hope I'm gonna meet him someday. I think I think I could have had a chance of doing that in Los Angeles now, but I skipped that trip. <laughs> Well, that's about it. Uh, Robert, thank you very much for this uh, talk. Uh, thank you for inviting really me awesome. and thank you for coming. Thank and I hope I've been somewhat useful or entertaining <laughs> enough for you. Uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, thank you again, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, you can uh, chill and have a break. We have tea and coffee and feel free to network and, and chat. Thank you for coming. <laughs>